Hello, and uh, thank you for joining us. I am in conversation today with Karen Martin, uh, Professor of Public Policy uh, at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Karen, uh, we have talked before yes. about uh, criminal justice and racial bias, uh, but after the tragic events last week, mm -hmm. I, um, I thought we'd talk about what we're seeing. I mean, a, a lot of people are saying to themselves, uh, look, there's been no progress at all mm -hmm. for years. I mean, Rodney King, and, and then we went through, we've gone through just endless anything. commissions yeah. and endless reports, and you know, police need better training, and, and nothing seems to happen. In fact, if anything, it seems to be getting worse. Mm -hmm. Is it getting worse? I think that's a complicated question because and on the one hand, any shooting of an unarmed civilian for reasons that nobody can actually justify quite well is a problem. That's a tragedy. Any loss of life is a tragedy. Just as any loss of life of a police officer for no apparent reason is also a tragedy. At the same time, I think there's certainly a lot of movement, um, not enough because they're still being, there's still shootings, a lot of movement in terms of bringing researchers into the fold and having researchers talk with law enforcement and having the public involved more. I know for a fact that there are law enforcement agencies across the country that are extremely concerned about racial bias, extremely concerned about shootings, um, feel that it is, they understand that they need to have better relationships with the community and that we are bringing a lot of more research to bear. So we actually are starting to collect more more data and better data because one of the issues is that we actually don't, there's not like a national database of every shooting that happens, surprisingly enough. Like we don't actually know all of the arrests, all of the shootings, all of the interactions, all of the use of force across the nation. And so I know a group of researchers, several groups of researchers are trying to actually move on that front. You know, it's amazing we don't know. Yes. I mean, after all these years uh, that there's not a national database of of shootings of, of civilians uh, by race, or even just knowing the shooting of civilians mm -hmm. uh, is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. I mean, w w why? Oh, well, that's a deep question, because I mean, one of the That's what I do, I do, <laughs> I I do deep questions. <laughs> well, oh. one of the issues is there's, a, there's about 18,000 law enforcement agencies in the country. So one of them is just, that it's a very fragmented system, which is unlike other countries. And you have to remember there's every level of government. So there's local, there's city, there's municipal, there's state, there's federal, there's tribal, and there's all different types of districts that cut across those. So DEA, you know, various types of law enforcement agencies. So given that huge morass of just bureaucracy, it's not easy, as you know, to administer a nationwide type of agency and say, here, give us all of your data. So we don't even know whether the situation is getting worse whatever worse means. Right. I mean, what we know is that there certainly appear to be more shootings based of, of, of innocent people mm -hmm. uh, who are black, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's become more graphic because we now have uh, videotapes of these things. And uh, But we don't know, what you're saying is we don't know that it's actually getting worse. I'm saying it's difficult to get a handle on the whole situation. It's, it, I think we are in a phase now where because of our cell phones, we can immediately, as was recently done this past week, immediately broadcast to the world what's happening. And so I don't want to say that we know for a fact that violence is getting worse toward in black communities because the history of this country, unfortunately, has been violence in black communities of the state against black people. And so we know that for a fact. I think what's changed is what is available to the public and how quickly it gets disseminated. And I think what's changed is the number of incidents in which technology plays a role. So we've got factors here, technology. We also have guns, Yes. Uh, weapons. I mean, the weaponization of the police, the militarization of the police, uh, also the weaponization of the public uh, has got to be contributing to this at some level. I think that's huge. And I think it's interesting now to, you know, President Obama's recent address brought up the fact that as a police officer, can you imagine, you know that your, your people are taking fire and you're also in an open carry state, which means many citizens have the legal right that they are exercising to carry guns. And so in an active shooter situation, you're actually surrounded by hundreds of people, perhaps maybe dozens of people who have guns and have a right to have a gun. And so how do you decide who's the quote unquote bad guy? Who's the person who's going to decide to use that gun against you? So I think it's extremely complicated. And I also think that the fact that we're saturated in guns is a part of this issue that we cannot afford to ignore anymore. Uh, what about, Karen, the fact that so many police uh, are white and mm -hmm. they are in black neighborhoods and they are not terribly uh, 
well trained with regard to implicit bias. Right. I'm not talking about explicit bias. Right. I'm talking about implicit bias that they may not even know. Yeah, I think a couple of things. One is that if you know of a stereotype, it affects the way you think. That is just the way our brains work. You do not have to believe in a stereotype. You know, you can actively, you can don't devote your life to fighting against negative stereotypes. It still affects the way the brain works. And so if there's an association between black men and violence, which is the stereotype that we have in this country and dominates lots of narratives, it doesn't matter what your actual personal beliefs are. You have to try extremely hard to overcome the natural associations that happen in your brain. So that happens regardless of race, unfortunately. And there's plenty of science out there. If people are interested, they can find it and read more about the details. But in general, if you have a stereotype, if you know of a stereotype, it's in your brain, it's going to affect what you do. There are ways to overcome it, and that's what researchers are trying to do now. Um, so to your question, to a certain extent, the race of the police officer doesn't actually matter that much because we're dealing with stereotypes and we're dealing with structural, contextual issues, right? So there's evidence you're saying that black police officers are carrying around the same stereotype of black men who might be dangerous, mm -hmm. might be carrying uh, firearms, uh, they're not w aware, or maybe they're aware of the stereotype, but mm -hmm. they're not aware of their own bias. Yeah, and, I mean, that's the way bias works. It's implicit bias because you're not thinking, I would now like to behave in a biased manner. It just affects how quickly you assess danger, right? So a person, a black person carrying an ambiguous object, you're more likely to think that that might be something dangerous than if it was a white person carrying an ambiguous object object and that is not like I am espousing the idea that black people are violent it's just the associations we have because of our country's history and the way the world works and, and so I mean given that um, are there ways of actually combating implicit bias you have a police a police uh, uh, you know a force in let's say Chicago uh, mm -hmm. that has a history of both explicit and what what seem to be implicit bias, how do you go after implicit bias? I, there are ways to do that, and there's plenty of science on that front. So, and I'm not an expert specifically on how to overcome implicit bias, but I know that it, it, people are working to figure that out. But one of the things that I do know is that by just raising the issue that implicit bias is a phenomenon, that is helpful, right? To understand that your brain has these associations, and so being able to perhaps slow down the behavior, right, as, a, as opposed to being fast to pull out your gun and fast to pull the trigger, realizing, oh wait, I remember this training about implicit bias, let me just take a moment and think about this a little bit more carefully. But I think implicit bias, I am a big proponent in investigating this, I think it obviously has a, long, a huge role to play, but I think the structure of policing, we really need to talk about that. And one of the things that has really disturbed me this past week is the framing of both sides. A lot of people are saying, you know, it doesn't matter what side of the debate you're on, it doesn't matter which side you're talking about, there are no sides. Right? We are a people, we are all in America, and police are supposed to be of and for the community. And so to talk about this is, you know, black lives matter versus blue lives matter, or then to get caught up in the debate about whether or not all lives matter is problematic, I think is just kind of aligning the deeper issue that, you know, we are actually all connected. In fact, it may be, uh, in effect, making it harder to right. see those connections Absolutely. and to understand that we are, it's not about one side or the other side. In fact, there are no sides. There are no sides. Uh, but, but if there are no sides, yes. and this is a huge public problem, yes. and the public is becoming aware of the problem, we've talked about part of the problem being implicit bias, mm -hmm. part of the problem being guns mm -hmm. and easy access to guns, uh, but is there also a problem in terms of the culture of the police mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how uh, how they think about their jobs? Yeah, I think there is. I think in a lot of especially brown, um, disenfranchised, lower income communities, there's been a history where the idea is to kind of contain, suppress, heightened suspicion, um, heightened awareness, heightened checking, right? And so, you know, I've talked about this before with my students. I ask people, have you ever broken the law? Of course, every single hand goes up because everybody has done something, maybe it's jaywalking, right? Maybe it's dropping a piece of litter by accident. Maybe it's riding your bicycle on the sidewalk. Those are all actually crimes in certain places. Um, so given that everybody kind of can commit easily violate the law, if you, somebody is constantly watching you, they're going to find you do something wrong, right? And so that's what we, this is kind of a, a microcosm of this situation we see in a lot of black and brown communities is because police are there 
putting subjecting people to a lot of scrutiny, of course they're going to find a lot more things in addition to all of you know implicit bias and stereotypes and harsh treatment like stop and frisk. Then of course you're going to find you're going to subject people to more scrutiny. The interesting thing is that typically um, black and brown people actually have lower rates of having a weapon, of having drugs versus the white population. Uh, whatever happened to community police? I mean, yeah. there was this idea. I thought it was gaining ground mm -hmm. that, you know, instead of being in your cars, uh, if you're a police officer, or instead of being armored, I mean, you get to know your community, you walk around your right. community, you make alliances with the community, uh, that you get, you develop trust with the community. Mm -hmm. What happened to that? Idea? I think it's still there. I think across the country there are a lot of law enforcement agencies that are completely on board with that and are having different levels of success with it. I think it's alive and well. So it is still there. But what you see is often that, um, you know, a lot of the shootings that we see that, you know, get filmed and are disseminated, it's not, it's a car and car situation, right? It's not the community policing way of doing policing when somebody's walking around, talking to people, seeing what's happening. It's car versus car. You get out of the car, a car is approached, somebody's running from a car, um, and then bad things happen. And so I think that, you know, I don't want to say that community pol policing has failed because of these shootings. I think it still has some viability, but obviously it's not a panacea. What about the organization? We, I mean, again, culture of police, what about how the police are organized? Right. Is there are there are there other things that uh, police departments ought to be doing? What are the most successful practices? I guess that's what I'm saying. Yeah, a lot. You know, it's important to keep in mind that police agencies tend to be very hierarchical, right? So the higher ups, the executive, the brass, have a lot of influence over the actual culture of the department and what people do. So I am heartened to see that there are a lot of police executives who are very concerned about this and are participating in research with researchers and are you know working with community members. So I will say that is a good thing. Um, and so in terms of influence in the culture, you need to you know. Deal, you need to make sure the brass understands what needs to happen, but you also need to make sure it's not just kind of a mandate, you know, rarely do, does a worker in any situation respond well to like, now do this entirely new different thing, right? So we do need some bottom-up training, you know, bottom-up approaches as well. So being able to communicate the importance of taking a different tack, of understanding what implicit bias is. Um, and I think a lot of it is really, you know, there's been plenty of incidents where mental health played a huge role in interactions and in the use of force where a person is altered, a person may even be threatening the police, but it's with a fist or it's with a knife and they get done, gunned down. And so that to me seems like a clear indication of a different approach in tr to training, right? A lot of times what I'm concerned about is the urgency that is used when we don't need urgency, right? There's a way to just wait somebody out, to talk to them, to you know, keep them away from other people so they're not gonna harm anybody, but just like, give it a second. You know, don't need to shoot anybody immediately. What, why aren't there more women? Uh, I mean, I, I don't wanna use, I, I don't wanna use a cultural stereotype mm -hmm. of women being more willing to stop and listen right. rather than to draw guns. Right. But I think there is evidence, uh, you know, that, Women are not involved in most of these interactions, and I'm talking about the police right. rather than the victims. I think that might be tricky to say with absolute certainty, just because there are so many fewer women than men in the police force, and so if you try to say in general women aren't involved, it could just be there's so few that just statistically speaking, if it was equally distributed, there would just be fewer women involved. Um, but there have been women involved in, you know, around responding to some of these things. And I also don't want to fall into the cultural stereotype. At the same time, I think that just a cultural kind of shift towards listening would be a great thing on many fronts, as you um, imagine also think. And so I think in law enforcement, being able to listen would be fantastic. And as you brought up community policing, that's about listening. That's, you know, one of the core tenets is to actually talk to people, hear their concerns, and be able to respond. Uh, let's go to back to politics and yes. guns, if we can, just yes. for a second. Because right now we've got many communities in this country, uh, primarily communities of color, mm -hmm. uh, who don't trust the police. Mm -hmm. uh, and every time there is another shooting, such as we've seen last week uh, in Louisiana and, and Minneapolis, in, in Minneapolis uh, you've got the, the, the public uh, 
generalizes, mm -hmm. uh, particularly these uh, communities, black and, and Latino com uh, communities, and they say, we can't trust the, the police. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the political response? I mean, if, if, if communities are becoming more segregated, mm -hmm. and you've got some communities that are more and poorer right. and blacker or browner, mm -hmm. how uh, are those communities going to be, how should they be brought on board? Uh, right. in terms of understanding that uh, not all the police are violent mm -hmm. and that they can play a role. Yeah, I think, first of all, I think plenty of people understand that entirely and are enthusiastic supporters of the police and understand entirely that they can rely on the police to provide some measure of public safety, want to improve the police, understand the role of police and support them. So I think it's really important to understand even people, you know, there's been relatives of victims who have come out and said, you know, we can't cast a broad cloth and broad brush and say that, broad, sorry, broad net and say that all police are bad. I think people understand there's nuances there. Um, and I think that, you know, again, I want to avoid the kind of us versus them in terms of bringing a community on board. I think it goes to, again, the, some of the deeper points about why communities are so segregated in the first place. I mean, that's a big, huge question that the country confronts over and over and over again. And becoming more segregated. And becoming more segregated. By income and yes. by, by race. Uh, and by skin color. Mm -hmm. And so these structural factors are really very central uh, to the ongoing problem, aren't they? They are, and I think that it's one of the things that I come up against, you know, talking to experts in the field, and we'll say, well, what are we supposed to do? And, you know, I tend to be the type of person who's like, well, we need to deal with kind of structural racism or the structure of, the, of, of how housing is, is um, organized or access to jobs or access to healthcare education and people often respond like well of course if you could fix everything then everything would be great but I think we do need to fix everything I mean we're in the place where we are because we haven't fixed everything and so we actually do need to be thinking kind of very macro level approaches to understanding the history of racial segregation in this country and what it brings us to but it's not just the history, it's getting worse. Yes. I mean, if you look at the data, uh, and you also just uh, wander around America, you see that we are many, um, and putting the South to one side, well, you don't even have, even including the South, right. we're becoming more segregated. Yes, New York City, becoming more segregated. Uh, and so if we're becoming more segregated mm -hmm. by race and income, mm -hmm. aren't we just uh, likely to have more and more of this, even if the police are better trained, even right. if... Uh, they deal with implicit bias. Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, uh, one prop, one idea is to have police exclusively come from the community in which they live, right? So there would be no suburban police coming to police urban areas and no none of the reverse. So that uh, community policing would be literally policing police coming from the community in which they live. And I think that, you know, interestingly enough, I think it kind of it highlights the fact that that has not been our approach to policing, that there's been, especially with black and brown communities, that you need to kind of come in and contain and suppress and scrutinize because they are known to be violent, right? The stereotype again, that we need, that's where crime is, so of course that's where we're going to go, right? Not realizing that simply subjecting somebody to lots of scrutiny, you're gonna see some more crime. So how about that idea? I mean, uh, having the police drawn primarily from the communities that are policing. Mm -hmm. Is that a radical idea? Is that possible? I think it, in this context, it's something of a radical idea. And, and I think, you know, in Dallas, um, they are actually having a hard time hiring enough police officers. It's not necessarily a very fun job. A lot of people would not like to have to carry a gun and be confronted with lethal force or being subjected to violence. Um, a lot of police officers aren't paid well enough. A lot of police officers feel like they aren't trained enough. So it's not like it's the most perfect ideal job that everybody wants. So to be real about what the what policing in this country is, that we need to actually invest in it the way we need to invest in teaching, the way we need to invest in plenty of plenty of um, medical care and plenty of aspects of society could make quality of life better for everybody. Law enforcement officers and associations around the country mm -hmm. are in the forefront of gun control. Yeah. I mean, the uh, chiefs of police mm -hmm. are saying we've got to get guns off the street, but we've also got to control access to guns. Mm -hmm. Why isn't their voice being heard? Why, are, why is it just... Uh, Every time we talk about controlling handguns or controlling assault weapons, right. uh, you, you know the, the the visual image is Democrats and liberals. Yeah, I don't know. I think we're so entrenched in that narrative. It's been that way for so long that it's hard to hear when that narrative is being kind of threatened or when it's being um, shifted a little bit or nuanced a little bit. I think you know that 
what would be great is if people who were concerned about police shootings could collaborate with police officers and police brass who are concerned about guns on the street and kind of form a new coalition or a new voice that could be a part of the gun debate. So Karen, uh, looking at the events last week, yeah. Uh, and looking at what we've talked about, that is the politics we just talked about, mm -hmm. the culture, uh, implicit bias, uh, getting guns, uh, trying to get guns off the street, but mm -hmm. also dealing with sort of the more fundamentals about structural racism, mm -hmm. widening inequality. Um, are you optimistic? Sometimes. <laughs> when? I'm optimistic when I think about the fact that these painful events are are finally bringing to public awareness and public consciousness things that have been happening for centuries. To me, that is a painful but necessary step in making progress. I think it's far too easy for people to think, well, that just happens over there, it doesn't affect me, or people deserved it because they're violent, doesn't affect me, or police are just doing their job, doesn't affect me, and to realize that we're actually all affected by these things. I think I've talked to plenty of people who aren't necessarily Biden the whole liberals who have been crying over these events because you can see the fabric of society disintegrating before our eyes, right? We do not want, nobody wants to feel like their lives are at stake in encountering the police. Nobody wants to feel like law enforcement, who is there to protect and serve, is under threat from the public. That is not fun for anybody. And so I'm optimistic when I think about the fact that knowledge is power, and that more people are understanding what's happening, and that more people are understanding that we need to change. And I'm heartened when I hear the debate being nuanced a little bit, right? And so understanding that just because a black person shot at police officers in Dallas does not mean that all black people or the entire black lives movement is fill in the blank. We can't generalize in that way. So when a newspaper, a prominent newspaper, on the basis of that uh, that Dallas shooting mm -hmm. uh, has a headline that says Civil War. Right. I mean that <laughs> is not only irresponsible, yes. that is actually verging on uh, on really a kind of kind of a negligence that makes our country more vulnerable. I would say it's instigation. I mean, that is essentially, you know, throwing a rhetorical bomb and then like, oh, what's going to happen? It's going to create more news. Great for us. I, I think it's completely irresponsible. I've seen, also seen, you know, tweets and posts and stuff about people saying, you know, oh, now the war is on or now finally, the, you know, bye bye Black Lives Matter and trying to frame this again as sides, right? There are no sides. We are all living here together. Um, so your optimism is founded on the hope, and I share it, honestly. Mm -hmm that when you have a series of incidents like we had last week, people become more aware. Mm -hmm. And that awareness is the beginning point mm -hmm. for the kind of dialogue and the kind of change that we really do need. Yeah. Uh, but is the awareness going to be coming fast enough? In other words, mm -hmm. there, uh, we have touched on, in just a very short time, structural problems, structural yeah. bias, stru structural discrimination, uh, and widening inequality mm -hmm. uh, that um, are, are so fundamental and mm -hmm. are in some ways getting worse. Uh, you know, you're elected president, let's assume, mm -hmm. uh, next November. Mm -hmm. uh, what, do you, uh, be, what do you do that's different from what we would expect uh, a president to do? Not Donald Trump, but right. let's say a, a reasonable, thoughtful yes. president. <laughs> what, would, what would you do? I think that there is already some momentum for criminal justice reform, and I say you keep that going. At a minimum, you keep that going. You don't try to restart or say, I'm going to have a whole new approach to start over. You, are, you build on what is already there. So doing things like trying to reduce mandatory minimums, which are prison sentences set in the law that if you commit this crime, you absolutely get this prison sentence, no discussion. So changing that type of thing. And that's already underway. And that's already underway. Getting rid of mandatory yes. minimum sentences. At least for some crimes, some places, et cetera, et cetera. But yes, it's underway. Um, getting rid of solitary confinement is underway for juveniles. And I think we need to do away with it, except for extreme cases and for a limited amount of time for everybody, because it makes no it's, it, it denigrates us to put a human being in a cage for years, so we need to do away with that. That's our, also something that's being discussed. Um, I think that there is plenty of political willpower around, re, around reducing costs, and so last time we talked about criminal justice debt and how it can actually cost the state much more money to try to collect debt than to have other approaches to punishing people, so I think there's movement on that and interest on that. So I say that a new reasonable president needs to come in and start with those things. 
but the new reasonable president also needs to keep nuancing this narrative. And I would like to talk to the new president and say, you need to get away from this us, them, different sides, police coming into community. It needs to be policing of the community. By the community. By the community. For the community. For the community, yes. Uh, Karen, one final question. Yeah. Uh, beyond the issue of shall we be optimistic, mm -hmm. um, uh, how do we envision um, conversations between the races. I mean, mm -hmm. um, you know, there, with all of this going on, you know, there, it's there. It's it's more important than ever, it mm -hmm. seems to me, uh, that blacks, Latinos, whites come together and discuss what's happening mm -hmm. and in their communities and even in the next community. Yeah. How do we get those conversations going? There needs to be a desire to do so. And this is when I turn cynical and pessimistic, is trying to think about what would bring a desire to do so, primarily amongst white people. I think that because of being subjected to certain things in society, people of color tend to want to be urgently discussing how to change things. And I think it's very easy for a lot of white people to not understand that reality. And so the will to want to have those discussions and so that goes back to my previous thought about the fact that these incidents are completely painful and devastating to see. At least they crack open the facade of denial, right? It is much harder to deny that you're participating in a community that's, that allows this to happen if you're seeing it happen all the time. And so in terms of, in terms of talking between the races, um, I think that we need to do whatever we can to, to generate a desire for that to actually happen. Well, certainly the footage that uh, a lot of people in their living rooms, a lot of white people saw mm -hmm. uh, last week mm -hmm. uh, from Minneapolis and also uh, Baton Rouge and Dallas, I mean, that was enough, I think, to shock people, let's hope, out of their denial. Right. And I think the issue is you it, you also run the risk, of course, of like fatigue, right? Oh, I just can't take it anymore. You know, no more of that. Can't watch any more videos. I'm sorry it's happening. I'm not a part of it. You know, just deal with it. And so the issue is that as people who are interested in politics and interested in you know organizing and social change is to make sure that we are harnessing the good feelings that are inherently in people, harnessing the optimism so that we can keep the conversation going to make sure we keep, maintain our energy across this denial. Well, let's keep our conversation okay. going, Karen. <laughs> thank you. And uh, thank you so much. Karen Martin, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Karen, uh, professor of uh, public policy, John Jay Criminal uh, John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York, uh, and a, uh, a wonderfully articulate and very important voice in all of thank this. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for coming.